Welcome back. So we are here talking about one of my favorite role-playing games, which is Paranoia. I sprung the money and I got myself the Red Clearance Edition and I've played it a handful of times. So I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the whole game, uh, how to play, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, and uh, different things that I've got out of it based on who I've played it with. So let's talk about... Uh, Paranoia, and I've I've sectioned this off into chapters, which I'm pretty f excited about. So the first one we've got is so the easiest way to talk about paranoia is to kind of set a like its setting and what it's kind of all about. And I always say, like picture a cross between 1984, We, uh, Brave New World, uh, that kind of dystopian. Uh, idea uh, with Monty Python or Kids in the Hall. So very sketch, comedy, bizarre, strange, doesn't make a lick of sense. Uh, and those two ideas really are the grounding foundation of paranoia. It's very silly, but it still focuses in on screwing over your com uh, compatriots and comrades uh, and, and making yourself look as good as possible to friend computer. Uh, and it's it's a very unique game setting in this uh, this way because everything happens in the alpha complex where you are a clone uh, and you've got six clones and you will most likely burn through a lot of them. Overseeing this all is a computer that has its own little quirky personality. So the main thing about this game that kind of makes it different than a lot of other games I find is that it encourages competition and uh, shies away from cooperative gameplay, which for many players is going to be a real challenge. Let's talk about uh, a little bit of the history and the setting of this game. So it was first published in 1984, a great year for this game setting, uh, by the West End Games. It's being touted as a darkly humorous future. This game has gone through a number of iterations and editions, and uh, it leads us to the current one, which is the Red Clearance Edition, um, with a lot of the fun little things that we have on there. Uh, so the core themes and settings are all the same and that's kind of the unifying theme of this whole thing. You know, Alpha Complex is struggling along, kind of like an outdated computer uh, with a very outdated, um, I guess, OS operating system. And it's your job to make sure that it keeps running the way that it has been for who knows how long. There are a few things that are added to this particular iteration of the game, such as the use of cards for abilities, items, secret societies, and roles that you will be playing. Uh, but the overall mythos of this game has stayed pretty close to center in that sense. Uh, so within this game, you play as a troubleshooter with different colors of clearance starting at infrared and then progressing up the rainbow to red orange yellow green blue indigo violet uh and you know the the higher up you go the less you actually see of them mainly because they've either run out of clones or they never even existed from the beginning now one of the main ways that you can upgrade your color setting is by occurring a xp i almost said hp uh and you get h you get it XP through supervisors, those who uh, are superior to you in your color code, uh, or through friend computer themselves. Uh, and you can then spend that either through necessities, uh, like food, water, drinks, that kind of thing, uh, gadgets and weapons, uh, as well as upgrade your color clearance. So as troubleshooters, it is your responsibility to oversee the day-to-day -day activity of Alpha Complex, which is this massive structure uh, which takes up an indefinite amount of space through different districts, color clearances, levels, and different characteristics. Uh, some districts completely disappear at times, others reappear randomly. It's really interesting in having a setting that's so singular. With Alpha Complex, it does provide a great balance between life-threatening obstacles over the most rudimentary tasks and missions. Uh, so for example, you could clean a light bulb, but uh, have yourself be electrocuted at any point. Uh, clean up a spill without realizing that underneath that spill, there's a giant, uh, 
uh, mutated clone ready to eat you. There's a really nice balancing between these mundane activities and these life-threatening obstacles that you need to overcome. So I I've already talked about the computer and the alpha complex. Let's dive deep into them then. So as I already mentioned, uh, the Alpha Complex is one of the most unique settings that I've ever had or encountered within a role-playing game. Uh, everything that you do or will be done will most likely be in Alpha Complex itself, overseen by the computer, unless you're in a dead zone. This does limit the opportunities in terms of variety of the environment, but within the limitations, that's where the creativity kind of comes through. Where can you make things interesting? How can you make things more original? The computer is something more of like an extremely high functioning outdated computer operating system trying to run the latest edition of a software uh, with pop-ups and everything all kind of at the forefront uh, but the operating system not knowing how to upgrade itself and that's where you have this constant paranoia that's going on here the computer itself is paranoid uh, it knows it's obsolete but it doesn't know what to do about that and similarly a lot of the player characters also kind of realize that it's the whole the emperor has no clothes but the parade still needs to happen you know you life in the alpha complex still needs to carry through and this is also where you want to play the computer not as this malicious overseer uh something from like the hal 9000 from 2001 a space odyssey uh this is something more like uh, and I remember somebody actually here on YouTube uh, qualify uh, the computer as more of like Clippy from Word. Uh, and I think that's the perfect thing to put into here is if it's Clippy trying to also make suggestions while you are doing these massive spreadsheet analysis. Uh, he has no real point of being here, but he's also the main reason why you're here. Playing it in that sense, I think can add a lot more fun and a lot more playing styles instead of just having this players against the computer. It's now more, uh, let's, let's throw each other under the bus so that we can appease this well-meaning but toddler <laughs> AI computer to get more experience points to try to climb yourself up this hierarchy of this bureaucratic mess. Now that we kind of know the setting, we know where we are in terms of the play styles, let's actually talk about some of the mechanics. So the game mechanics, the basic breakdown is whenever you want to do anything, you build a pool of dice based on what stat you are using and what skill you are using. You use those two numbers to roll that many dice, adding them together. Uh, any sixes or fives you roll, because you always use a d6 in this game, uh, that's considered a success, a success. The more successes you get, the higher the possibility that you succeeded in whatever you wanted to do. So for example, if you are trying to punch a guard to get past them, uh, and that's always my go-to uh, example, I don't know why I always lean to violence, uh, you would use your violence stat plus your uh, melee or athletics. Uh, so you would take whatever number you have in violence, whatever number you have in melee, add them together, that's how many dice you roll, you roll them up, and that's how many successes you have. If your pool is negative, so say for example, you know, if it's a three, minus five, you have a negative two. You still roll two dice. If you don't get a five or a six, that is considered a negative. You subtract that to however many successes you are. So you're more likely to occur a negative number. So you can actually succeed in the negatives. Now with this pool, you always roll uh, a computer dice. Uh, and if you roll a six, that's where the computer comes into effect. Uh, you automatically lose some of your moxie, and I'll talk about moxie in a little bit. You know, that's where the pop-up comes up for Clippy or for the computer saying, I see you're trying to take out this guard. It might be very adamant if you go and do something else. So it provides something that the character must overcome in the immediate situation to take some time. Now, I do see that certain people didn't really like this as it retracts from the overall scene that's going on. So I always try to make this as apparent and as applicable as possible. The computer would come in and say, ah, I see you are trying to knock out this one 
uh, individual. I will help by providing another guard in its place to give you more practice. So that's kind of where uh, it's applicable to the situation and it provides something that you need to overcome immediately. And while we're talking about the dice pooling and all that, this is the only game that I've run into so far that the GM doesn't roll uh, uh, any dice. They are a complete neutral party. And I know uh, the book makes a really big deal out of this. As a DM, I was just like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I don't have to roll a single dice. This is great. All I have to do is recommend whatever they have to roll. Do it. Yeah, this is amazing. Uh, I know that certain DMs don't like not having that control and don't like having that say of, well, I want to roll some dice to find out what happens. I had no problem with it. I thought it was great. Uh, it, it also puts the, the entire fate back into the player's hands to essentially allow them to have as much rope as they need to hang themselves. Let's talk a little bit about Moxie, because Moxie does have a, a real use in this game, and I actually really, really enjoy this mechanic in the game as well. It takes two of my favorite things from other role-playing games. It uses the Fate points uh, from Fate, uh, as well as the Sanity points from Call of Cthulhu, uh, and kind of blends them all into one mishmash. So the currency is very much um, like spending fate points in fate. Uh, you can use them to re-roll any of your dice pools. You can add dice to it. Uh, and by doing so, you less your amount of moxie. You also use moxie points to activate mutant powers. It's almost like your mana well if you're using like a high fantasy magic kind of a game. Now the trade-off is that sanity points because moxie points essentially represent your grip you have on reality and how with it you are. So the less moxie points you have, the less grip you have on reality and the more likely you are to start like blowing a gasket losing it and just like completely losing your mind and just like being overwhelmed of the stress of society so somebody who has six moxie are going to be a little bit more calm and a little bit more with it than somebody who has three and I always recommend to players, especially if they're trying to do something that's very stressful, I always say, well, you know, you've got three moxie there, so maybe it's going to be a little bit more difficult to do. Uh, and also in terms of role playing, you want to be a little bit more, we call it squirrely, a little bit more off hinged. I really love this combining of like spending moxie points, but also what that currency actually entails and what it reflects. You just have to remind characters and players to be aware of spending it, uh, to spend it, and then role play as whatever your moxie point score is currently at. Because once you reach down to zero, your clone either dies by just throwing themselves off of a cliff uh, and I always say the more you act it out and just have a blast with it the better it becomes um, or you find a way to cool yourself down uh, and that's always a fun fun little way to role play now let's let's talk a little bit about XP because we've already touched a little bit about XP and if moxie is kind of your currency in terms of how to play your character as unhinged as possible xp is what you are what what this whole game is about it's about recurring xp uh the main resource for upgrading your character much like any other game although unlike other games where you reach a level uh xp is just kind of an arbitrary number uh and that's kind of what i love about this game xp is kind of like the points from whose line is it at any anyway uh where the rules are made up and the points really don't matter that's essentially what this is, right? Like you get XP left, right, and center, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really mean anything. Uh, there's no like set down rule of after 500 XP, you level up to yellow or orange or whatever. It's just the computer's just like, yeah, you have enough XP now to elevate yourself to yellow. Now, here's the main thing though. You want to instill it in your players that you need XP. You gotta have it because without XP, you can't buy your fuzzy, bubbly, bouncing drink. Uh, you can't buy your upgrades to the next sector that you need to go to. Um, you, you want to have this conflict, this competition for always getting XP. And one of the main ways to get XP is by throwing other people under the bus uh, because the computer is paranoid over mutants, traitors, terrorists, uh, certain illegal uh, secret societies. So any way that you as a player can throw any of your other players under the bus 
you can get XP. And so that's where the main competitive aspect of this game really comes into the forefront and playing with it. Okay, so now that we know how to play the game and we know the setting of the game, let's talk a little bit about the character creation because that's one of my favorite aspects of this game. This is the only point where it's more of a collaborative thing, but even then it is definitely a competition because every time you give yourself an advantage, you're giving your players, your other player, a disadvantage. You essentially choose the different skills and there are uh, 16 different skills to choose from. Uh, if you choose a plus one in athletics, the player next to you gets a negative one in athletics. They choose one, the other person gets a negative, and you go around uh, for each player, giving yourself bonuses and screwing over your teammates until each of you have from negative five all the way to plus five. Once you have that, you add those skills that create a roll, uh, a row, add them together, it gives you a single numeric, uh, numerical value that you then the person that you've been screwing over gets to choose where to put it in, either violence, brains, chutzpah, or mechanics in terms of the stats. Those two numbers, your stat number, as well as your skills, that's what you're going to be using to build your, your dice pool. Honestly, I love this idea. I love this idea that it ingrains this double comp like double idea of competition between players as well as trying your best to screw them over what i also love is for your personality you choose three words in the positive that describes your character that could be brave smart strong perseverance like anything that's a positive uh the other person that uh, you have been screwing over or whatnot, they get to choose one of those words and flip it into the negative. So instead of being strong, you're now weak. Instead of brave, you're now a coward. This also shows uh, more of a well-rounded character. Uh, I really, really enjoyed the character creation because it's also extremely easy. There's no like adding numbers here or this stat represents this characteristic and you need to add these three numbers together to get another one. You're basically just putting uh, plus ones through plus fives and negative ones and negative fives and you've got a full well-rounded character within this small sheet of paper. Uh, it was super fun to do and one of my favorite aspects of the game is just getting a group of people together and seeing how they can screw one another over by creating all their stats and their skills. Let's, uh, let's talk about some of the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and let's start with First up are the action cards that I really enjoyed. This is something that's very unique to this game, or at least that I've seen so far. Dungeons and Dragons had a little bit of something like this in uh, the fourth edition right at the end uh, by trying to incorporate these card mechanics. Whenever you get into combat, you deal out three cards to each player, uh, and each one is either a reaction or something to add to the environment. Uh, and so how you determined order is by using these cards. Uh, and the order of the cards, you have action order. And it goes from zero all the way to plus six. Uh, and you choose one of the three cards, put it down without showing people, and either say that's a six or that's a zero. And it's a little bit of a game of bluff. Uh, if they call you on it and you are right in calling their bluff, you get to go first. But if you're wrong, then they get to go first and you get to go last. So it's kind of a fun little mechanic that they've already put in, again, to encourage competition. It's extremely hard and almost impossible to replicate in a virtual setting. And I want to be talking a little bit about that later on. But I also love it. I love that it keeps it fast, fun, and original. With these action cards, uh, it's either reaction to do things or something that you can incorporate in the game. So when you're actually in initiative order and combat is happening, you can do some of these so that the, the action itself and what you're doing is never the same. You're never having the same thing of just, you know, essentially attacking with the great ax over and over and over again. You're having other options to come out. The other thing that I love about this game is the actual book. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail of what's in the red level clearance box, but you get three books and these things are hilarious if you wanna just sit down and read. Like if you've played a lot of role-playing games, uh, reading through this is just hysterical. I found myself laughing out loud a number of times. And so it really gives you a good idea of how to run the game just based on the flavor of the text. What I also love is they're they're dealing with gender and sexuality in this game by essentially saying gender is now uh, obsolete because of cloning. So that's some of the fun things. Uh, let's go to some of the bad things unfortunately. 
Now, there's not too many bad things about this, but this is just some of the things that I've came up to that I want people to keep in mind. Uh, the first is the, the actual mechanics of the game. Unlike other games where there's a little bit more structure in terms of gameplay, in terms of role playing, this one's a lot more open ended and it does lean very heavily on the characters to take initiative. Unlike other games where you can basically just plop down a mission and away you go, this one does, because of the mundane missions that you're on, you need to have the players trying to screw one another over to provide a lot of the good times. Or at least that's kind of my feeling over. Uh, as I mentioned, I played this across a number of different people. And I did find the most amount of fun that we were having was when one another were trying to just screw each other over. I do also find it's harder for players to play competitively when so many other games rightfully encourage cooperation to you know oversee whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, and so you really need to have that sit down beforehand conversation with players to say, hey, this game isn't like other ones. You're going to be competing for XP points the entire way through. And you want to make sure that that's in your forefront. You also need to really be cognizant about the players that you're having here. If you're like me and you've played with a lot of different people, you know that there are certain people that this game will not work for. Uh, either they are too competitive and take things way too personally, uh, or they're not competitive at all and always want to get people to play cooperatively. I definitely fall into that second category. I find it very hard to play competitively because I'm always trying to get people to come together for the greater good. Uh, but I also know there's a number of individuals that I've played with that whenever you try to do something that screws them over, they take it very personally. And so you need to really have that sit down beforehand to really like say, this is not personal. This is just in the fun of the game. Don't worry, we're not being malice here. This is just part of the fun. So I was playing through the starter game in the red level clearance box and it does a really, really good job of hand holding a, the first time GM throughout this game to say, and then this happens and this is how this gets resolved and this is what happens when this happens. But I also find that when describing the combat, uh, I don't know what to do when it comes to the threats for the characters because I don't roll any damage dice, right? Like I don't roll any dice. So what I usually have them do is as players at the end of each round, I just say, okay, start rolling um, saves against avoiding these things or uh, roll to see if you miss the attack from so-and-so or whatever, or I just start dealing out damage. It's, it's really hard to kind of conceptualize what to do with my NPCs when it comes to a combat because it really doesn't give you too much stats. Like it says a plus three, but I still don't know what that plus three means if I'm rolling it. So usually what the, I put that to is they have to roll more than three successes in order to avoid this attack, whatever they're doing. And the last thing in terms of like the bad is that this is one of the harder games to translate uh, virtually. I mean, we haven't been able to play face to face for over a year now. Uh, and the only way that I've been able to test play this is virtually. So essentially all the cards that were really good addition to this game are now obsolete because I can't translate that in a virtual setting. So I've had to kind of finagle my way around that, uh, especially in combat, uh, by saying, okay, whoever wants to go first can go. Like it's very loosey goosey in that sense. So I just say, whoever wants to go can go and whatever you want to do, go for it. In that sense, it does leave some characters very confused because especially if they're first time players, they don't even know what to do. Uh, and unless they're comfortable in playing outside the box and saying, well, I want to do this, this, and that, if they don't have like a preset down, like menu list of actions they can take, it's very hard for them to come up with actions for them to take. So that was another thing that I kept in my mind to always have different actions that they could take as suggestions. So now let's talk about some of the ugly or miscellaneous things. These aren't necessarily good or bad. They're just kind of inflections. They're things to keep in mind. And I've already touched on a little bit in terms of how open-ended this game can be in terms of actions and what to do, that you do need to keep characters and players aware that they can essentially do whatever they want. So don't be afraid to take the reins and go off script at any time. Like I actively encourage that. And some 
characters love this and really shine. Others really hesitate, and it really takes a, a, a getting used to within this new kind of style of play. The other one is the Moxie points, as it's it can be a new concept, especially for new players, to get their head around. Uh, you will need to remind players, especially as a GM, to use the Moxie points and have your character behave as such. It is a good mechanic, but one that really does take a little bit of getting used to because it does combine kind of two things at the same time. Also, one of the main mechanics of this game that I haven't touched upon yet is the debrief. The debrief is usually what happens after the main mission has been accomplished or failed, uh, and you come back to the supervisor who gave you that mission, and it gives you a chance to occur more XP by throwing people under the bus as this supervisor asks you, we have it on record because the computer has been recording your whole actions, uh, you were doing this, that, and the other thing. Give me a little bit more reason behind that and allow players more chance to throw them other to the bus. Some players really love this. Other players find that it's a tacked on ending that prolongs the gameplay. So unless you're really planning and remembering to do this, it can be hard to make it flow seamlessly into your game because usually by the end of the mission you guys are like done that's it you're you you've had not necessarily you've had enough but you're you're done you're you're ready to move on and by tacking on this debrief it can be a little bit much so this is one that i've actually opted to skip sometimes and actually have added it as the beginning of the first gameplay of the next session which gives them a little bit of distance because they don't really remember which allows them to create things on the fly and if you're a good dm you take your notes uh, so you can challenge them on some of these you know lying areas the other thing that can get a little bit interesting is uh, creating your dice pool i always say that this is the only um area where you cooperate with your characters because as a dm i'm i'm very hands-off i'm like you guys do whatever you want this also allows me an opportunity to chat with them about what dice pool they want to create instead of having them say well these are my two highest ones so i want to roll those as often as possible i always say what is it that you're trying to do in the moment what are your stat and the skills that you want to use to see this as a success and i'll be able to chat with them a little bit within that and that's where this cooperative thing comes uh this is the only time where i actually push for more of a cooperation rather than a competitive aspect but do keep in mind that as the gm you do have final say so if they're always trying to make make themselves roll their two highest scores say well that doesn't really make sense in the setting that we're in right now uh, and also keep a mind open for those who are trying to min max their character and always using those skills put things into place that forces them to use their smaller skills or also just start killing their clones, right? Like that's something I, I'm going to talk about in the, the advice for GMs. Have absolutely no hesitation for killing clones. Uh, they've got six. That's, that's a lot. I've already mentioned about this red clearance box. I've got it. It's great. It comes with all of the action cards, uh, lots of your secret societies and what they mean. Uh, in terms of the bonus duties, uh, your mutant powers, as well as equipment. And I believe you can actually go on um, the publisher's site uh, and download more cards to create. What I love about this is you get these dry erase cards. I'll put that up so you can actually see it there. Uh, and you can just reuse these over and over and over again. Now, again, lockdown, so I haven't been able to actually use them properly. But you also have a fillable PDF that's online that's very easy to use. Uh, and that's it's just a very easy thing. Uh, you also have your Game Master's Handbook, your Mission Book, and your Player's Handbook. Uh, and it's everything you need to run this game. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about some advice uh, after running this game a number of times. These are some of the things that I've learned about the game and things that I would either do differently, not do at all, or start adding into my game. Uh, so first up for GMs, as I mentioned right at the beginning, like right before this, you have to be okay with killing clones. I know that as a, uh, a GM for a number of different games, I always try my best not to kill clones players. Uh, I have spoken with other DMs who are adverse to killing their players and like will do everything in their power not to. I'm not like that. If you make a bad mistake and you know if the dice roll poorly, even if you don't have any control about it, I have no problem killing characters, but I don't like actively start killing them. This is a different game, right? You got to be okay with just offing characters left, right, and center, especially if this is a 
like a one shot that you're playing or you're only playing for three or four sessions. Uh, if you think about it, if you're playing for three sessions and you've got six clones, that's two clones per session that you want to off. So keep that in mind. Just be okay with killing your, your characters. So moving on to another one, this is something that I do in every game that I play, um, which is like kind of session zero, but this is where you chat with your characters uh, and players about what to expect in this game. And this one, you really, really need to have that. Uh, you need to set expectations about what this game is about. You really need to drive home that this is a uh, fun, competitive game where you want to one up your, your comrades and every different turn and make it as fun as possible in that sense. One thing that I would actually add to this game is incorporating personal agendas, secret little agendas and different tasks that different players need to overcome or do. Incorporate a little bit with the secret societies and like this is what the secret society does and this is what you kind of want to have in your forefront, but this is something for the character to actively act towards. If they do it, they get more XP, and if they don't do it, they get Treason Stars. I don't think I've ever actually talked about Treason Stars yet. No, well. Um, we'll talk about Treason Stars right after I do this. So by introducing this, it gives characters a little bit more of a roadmap of what to do, and it will kind of skirt around that issue that I had for characters that didn't know what to do in a massive sandbox and didn't really have like something to pick from a menu uh, this gives them a menu that oh well i see here that whenever this happens i need to do this it gives them something to do so i think by adding that into the game will provide a little bit more fun and a little bit more direction for characters as well the last one i want to talk about and this one's always the fun one is for the xp points um give them out like candy and don't give any rhyme or reason for it uh, especially for the computer or for supervisors make characters work for it but also don't be afraid to just hand them out left right and center for no particular reason and if somebody tries to do something that earned another player XP points before, uh, give them treason stars. Uh, this is where it's really, really fun to have these two types of currency fly back and forth between XP points and treason stars. It will frustrate them. It will provide so much fun and groundwork. It, it's, it was something that I found really, really fun within this. Okay, for players, these are some ex, um, pointers and things if you're playing the game to kind of look out for. Uh, first off, be okay with your clones dying. Like, they're going to die, so be okay with that. Try to make those deaths as memorable and as fun as possible. This is really, like, some of the, the creme de la creme uh, aspects of the game that I particularly love. Uh, also, be okay with throwing your teammates under the bus. Uh, this is, you know, counterintuitive to so many other games where you want to uh, elevate your characters and your friends. Not this game. Be fine with uh, backstabbing and screwing over and uh, leaving them out to dry. Uh, this gives you lots of opportunities to screw with uh, your, your teammates, but also try to screw around with your GM. I had so much fun when my characters were trying to screw uh, with either my plans that I had or the computer's plans. Maybe I'll reward you with XP points if I particularly find it really fun, or I might throw some treason stars at you because I don't really enjoy that particular item. Uh, but this game leaves lots of rope uh, for you to both hang yourself and other people. Lean into the absurdity of the situation while still being cognizant of it. Like everybody knows that Alpha Complex is falling apart and it is obsolete, uh, but nobody really wants to do anything of it because this is where we live. It's one of those um, constantly pointing out how just bizarre and strange while still allowing the parade to continue if this is the emperor's new clothing uh, and also don't be afraid to go off script there's nothing to say you have to follow the mission outside of your direct orders and by not doing so that's treasonous this game is a massive sandbox for you to play in so utilize that to your best um, best ability because really at the end of the day the actual mission that you're on is probably the most mundane aspect of the game so that's where a lot of this originality and fun comes in. This is one of the few games that will actively reward you for doing so. 
And now for some final thoughts, my final, like, wrapping this whole thing up into some concise points. Uh, Paranoia is great for anybody that's looking for, and now for something completely different. Uh, It's fun, it's fast, it's very easy to learn. It has one of the most flat learning curves I've ever encountered outside of a one-page RPG. Uh, it's super easy to get into for new players and old players alike. It definitely isn't for everybody, and the setting is very unique and might turn some people away, but also might really get other people excited. So I recommend checking it out. If not the red clearance box, then check out some of the past iterations of this game. But I still feel like the red clearance box is probably the easiest way to get into this game, and one that I give like two major thumbs up. I had a blast playing it, and I look forward to playing it more in the future. So yeah, that's what I've got for Paranoia Red Clearance Edition. Have you guys played this one? I really want to learn, uh, I really want to hear what other people have experienced within this game. What they found works, what they found don't work, what things they add to the game to make it a little bit more their own. Uh, If you have any experience with this game, please let me know by commenting down below. Uh, I'd really, really love to hear how you guys have been playing this game because this one is a very, very unique one. Uh, And that's about it for me. Uh, I'm really, really excited that you guys stuck around for this one. I am trying a different format, a little bit longer in form. And let me know how you enjoyed it. If there's anything I can improve upon, anything that you wanted me to touch upon that I didn't. Um, And if there's any role-playing game that you want me to talk about. uh, I really, really would like to hear from you. Uh, And yeah, I think that's about it. Uh, Don't forget to like, subscribe, do all that thing, call to order, uh, call of actions, all that great stuff. And um, yeah, I just hope that you guys are having fun. Keep playing and uh, enjoy yourselves. And uh, we'll catch you in the next one. See ya.